importantly, grab your Bible. Uh, the Bible is our main textbook for today's study. And we're looking at the resurrection of Moses. What are the implications of that? What does the scripture say both in Deuteronomy and outside? And uh, so we look forward to you studying with us here uh, today. Um, now, before we go ahead and invite our singers out to lead us in worship, I want to invite you to take advantage of a free gift offer that we have for you here this morning. And uh, that is entitled, The Day of the Lord, Amazing Facts About the Return of Jesus Christ. And uh, so this is one of the most comprehensive studies and resources that you can find in concern to the second coming of Jesus. What does the Bible teach on that? Go ahead and take advantage of that. All you have to do is dial one 866 788 3966, and uh, we will be happy to send that out to you. Ask for uh, offer number 825. That's number 825 when they go ahead and answer that call. And uh, we'll send it out to you if you're in North America. That's Canada, U.S., and different U.S. territories. Glad to be able to get that to you. Now, if you'd like to get a digital copy of that and you are in the uh, North American continent, we're happy to be able to uh, have that available to you as well. And so just go ahead and uh, text that. You want to text that to the uh, information that is on the screen, and uh, we'll be able to uh, you'll be able to get a free digital download uh, for that. We are happy that our singers are here to be able to lead us out in song, and I uh, want to invite you to uh, join with us. you to join me as we ask the Lord to be with us in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to be here this morning. For those of us who are in the church and for those of us who are uh, watching online or on television, we want to pray, God, that you will bless each and every one of us as we open your Bible. We claim that promise that your Holy Spirit will come upon us and lead us and guide us into all truth to give us spiritual discernment. And we Pray again, Lord, that uh, you will fulfill your promise and send that to us even now. Please be with our teacher, Pastor Doug, as he brings the word to us. And of course, be with his heart, his mind, his lips as he uh, brings to life 
and explains the word of God for us again today. In Jesus' name we pray these things, God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Sean. And I appreciate our singers. That was beautiful. Morning. Good to see each of you here. And I want to welcome again those who are watching. We know that there's always a, a lot of people of, uh, from a kaleidoscope of different countries around the world that are studying with us for our Sabbath School study hour. And I'm almost, almost going to have to learn how to do this again. It's been so long since I've taught the lesson because we just came off doing this uh, evangelistic program and there was a lot of other things going on. And I'm kind of sad because Deuteronomy is my favorite book in the Bible. And I've only been able to teach about three or four of these lessons, but I'm glad that I get to come here for the, the finale and study this with you. Moses is probably one of the most um, central characters of the Bible. Of course, not only did he write six books, now you're thinking six, you've got you know Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Job would be number six, but um, he really is the great lawgiver in the Bible that God spoke through. He's the one who was the, the doctor that took care of the birth of a nation. He was there when Israel was brought out. He's a great savior. And Moses is such a unique character because, of course, he's born uh, as a slave, but he's adopted through miraculous means, raised up in the, um, the palace of the most sophisticated country in the world at that time. So he received... Uh, the best education available in his day. And then he goes from the palaces and, you know, he kills that Egyptian, has to run out in the wilderness. And he ends up spending 40 years following around those sheep and goats in a desert. And he probably figured that's how he would end his days. But at 80, God calls him again and says, I've got uh, another big job for you. Just an incredible life that Moses lived. Now, Moses' life is divided in an interesting way, three generations. You have the 40 years of Moses' life where he is in Egypt. Then you have the 40 years where he is in the wilderness. And then you have the 40 years where he's leading people from Egypt to the borders of the Promised Land. So this is at the birth of the nation. When Israel is finally settled in the Promised Land, they have three 40s. You've got the 40 years of King Saul, the first king, who starts to deliver them from the Philistines. Then you've got 40 years of David's reign. And then you have 40 years of Solomon's reign. And then the kingdom is divided. So you've got 40 is sort of like in a generation in the Bible. And that's why I think it's interesting that Jesus said in about 30 AD, Speaking of the destruction of the temple, he said, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown away. This generation will not pass away. Jesus makes that prediction in 30 AD and 70 AD, 40 years later, the temple is destroyed. So even the numbers connected with the life of Moses are amazing. Well, we're coming to the end of Moses' life, but it actually is kind of ending on a happy note. The title of the lesson is The Resurrection of Moses. And we have a memory verse. The memory verse is from the book of Jude. And this is verse 9, because there's only one chapter in the book of Jude. If you have your, your quarterly with you, you can find this in your Bible. Uh, I'd encourage you, just say it out loud with me. This is Jude verse 9. Here in your lesson, it's from the New King James Version. You ready? Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but he said, the Lord rebuke you. It's talking about some contest between Michael the archangel and the devil and the body of Moses. And so uh, this comes up a little later in the lesson, so we'll take a closer look at that. But um, if you go to section one, it talks about the sin of Moses. Now, Moses, while he was a man, in many ways, that was a type of Christ. He was a human. How many humans have sinned? All. Just the right side of the auditorium? Maybe just the left? Some of you 50-50 down the middle? It was everybody. You could even look at the person on the left and the right and say, you know, you're a sinner. And you'd be telling the truth, don't do it, but you could. So we're all sinners. 
except one person. Who is it that lived a life without sin? Jesus. So even though Moses was a great man, and you know there's some Bible characters, you, you don't really find a record of the sin of Daniel in the Bible. But, you know, Daniel in chapter 9, he says, while I was confessing my sin and the sin of my people, he saw he was a sinner. Joseph, I mean, Joseph, he, he was so obedient. But you don't really find a record of any sin in Joseph's life. But uh, even these godly people, Elijah, we read that he was a man subject to like passions as we are. He struggled. He got discouraged and prayed he might die. So they were human. So don't get discouraged. But Christ was sinless. Even Moses, he, he made some mistakes along the way. And if you look in your lesson, the first section here talking about the sin of Moses, before I get to that, uh, we're, we're not going to get to the big sin that kept him out of the promised land. First you read in Exodus 2, verse 11. It came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, and he went to his brethren, and he looked at the burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. He looked this way and that. He knew he was going to do something to that taskmaster, so he looked around to see if there were any witnesses. And when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Maybe he thought this was going to be the first step in launching a revolution to help all the slaves rise up and help him overwhelm the Egyptians. He had a sense that God wanted to use him somehow to deliver his people from the Egyptians, but that wasn't God's plan. He kind of acted on his own, committed murder in the process. You go to Exodus 4. And when God calls him, this is after the 40 years in the wilderness, God calls Moses and says, I want to use you. And he starts to equivocate and make all these excuses. And this is Exodus 4, 13. He said, oh, my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever you will send. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Now, would God get angry with Moses unless Moses had done something wrong? Does that make sense? So Moses sinned. He had said, no, I don't want to do it. And you get someone else and look online. You'll find somebody. I, I, I haven't spoken Egyptian in years. And God said, who made man's tongue? And then you read in Exodus 4, 24. And it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Now, this is, we always get questions about this interesting little episode. You, you just, you read the words, the Lord sought to kill him. And it's almost like God swung and he missed. If God wants to kill you, can he kill you? Yes. No, it means that the, he was, he had judgment. He had like uh, the sword of Damocles hanging over him. Kind of like Balaam, an angel with a sword. He said, if it wasn't for the donkey, I would have slain you. And so, you know, sometimes God shows you're on the verge of disaster because Moses was disobeying when it came to the covenant of circumcision. And so we see that, you know, in the life of Moses, that he was, he was a person. He, he loved the Lord. He wanted to serve the Lord, but he made mistakes. But then finally, unfortunately, near the end of his life, he's just about brought the people to the borders of the promised land. Moses became exasperated. And you feel for him because you think, after all he's been through, uh, to kind of lose it on the borders of the promised land like that, how tragic. Now you read about this in Numbers chapter 20, verse 7. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation. Now this is happening because they're out of water again. Gather the congregation and speak to the rock before their eyes. What were they to do? To speak. They were not to shout. They were not to beat the rock. They were to speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Now, this evidently had happened several times because, you know, when they first came out of Egypt, they drank water at the springs of Mara, and um, then they went further in the desert, and they had no water, and they cried unto Moses, and Moses, uh, he struck the wa rock one time. Water came out of the rock. That was a type of Christ. That was only supposed to happen one time. Jesus was only smitten once. For you, meaning, you know, there was only one judgment of Christ. And, um, but as they went from place to place, it seems like this miracle was repeated. 
because Paul says the rock that followed them was Christ. And it talks about this rock that living water came out of. And uh, so this had to happen more than one time. Speak to the rock and it will yield its water. And you'll give the congregation to drink and their animals. So it must have been quite a bit of water. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as the Lord commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we bring water out of this rock? Then Moses lifted up his hand and he struck the rock twice with his rod. And water came out abundantly. And the congregation, their animals drank. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Because you did not believe me to hallow or to honor me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. Ooh, that's a pretty heavy judgment. I mean, your whole life mission has been to be used of God to bring the people into the promised land. And here, not far from the borders of the promised land, you lose your temper and you sin. And uh, now, what was the sin of Moses in this event? Some people think the Lord is being pretty harsh on Moses. I mean, if you had to lead this, the Bible says they were stubborn and stiff-necked people. Um, several times Moses said, Lord, why did, you, why did you have me responsible for all these people? He said, did I bring them forth? I'm not their father. Why have I got this burden? And uh, 40 years of judging the people. You know, the Bible tells us that Moses sat as a judge. First, he was judging every little case, and then he got some elders to help him, but he still was sitting as sort of the Supreme Court all their disputes. You know what a judge has to do? He's got to listen to problems all day long. And he's got to find solutions. You can you see where Moses would get tired? And how many times did they lose faith? God, you know, saves them from Egypt through all the plagues. Then they lose faith there at the borders of the uh, Red Sea. And then God parts the sea for them, which would, you know, probably stick in my mind. Then they run out of bread and they say, the Lord doesn't love us. He brought us out here to kill them. God gives them bread. Then they run out of water, God gives them water. Then they're attacked by their enemies, God delivers them from their enemies. You think time after time, they said, oh, we need some meat, God sends them quail. Time after time, when a miracle arose and God answered their prayer, you think they'd finally start behaving. But this goes right up to the borders of the promised land. And can you understand maybe why Moses would become exasperated? Now, are we a lot better than the children of Israel? How many of you have had God perform miracles of provision for you in your life? Have you sometimes forgotten his provision? Uh, when something goes wrong, you know, five minutes of listening to the devil, you can forget all of God's miracles and blessings in your life. It's just amazing how that works. And Moses, I don't know what happened. He, he was tired, he was exasperated, and he and Aaron, they got so angry, they struck the rock, they sort of berated the people, you rebels. He struck it twice. God didn't tell him to strike it at all. And evidently, he just, he lost his temper. Probably Moses had lost his temper with some righteous indignation when he killed the Egyptian earlier in his life. And yet the Bible says he was the meekest man that ever lived. So what was the sin of Moses? I've got four things here that I, I identify in this experience. One, God had commanded him to take the rod in his hand and to speak to the rock. Moses disobeyed and he smote the rock. Secondly, he struck the rock twice, which indicated an anger of spirit and a want of attention to the presence of God. He forgot that he was a messenger for God and God was there. Three, he permitted his spirit to be overwhelmed by a sense of the people's hardness of heart and thus being provoked was led to speak unadvisedly with his lips. Hear now ye rebels. That's not what God told him to say. And four, he did not glorify God, but he took the glory and the honor for this miracle on himself. He said, must we bring you water out of the rock? Moses was not a magician. Now the interesting thing about this is even though Moses did all of those things wrong, did God still bring water out of the rock? I wonder how many times God has answered our prayers even though we pray wrong. And sometimes God is blessed even though the messenger is flawed. 
I remind myself of that frequently, that the word of God has inherent power, and even though I could be a flawed vehicle, God can still perform a miracle for you. I remember uh, meeting a man that said he came to the Lord at uh, listening to an evangelistic program by an evangelist that was later arrested for living a double life. But while the evangelist was up preaching, he was saying things that were true. This man gave his heart to Jesus. Even though the evangelist, at the very time he was preaching, was misbehaving badly with finances and with girlfriends. And I, that, that struck me. This was years ago when I was uh, pastoring in New Mexico. This guy, he just said, you know, this, his sermon brought me to the Lord. I thought, the Lord used him. And then I remember God can speak through a donkey, right? So God performed the miracle because he's God, even though Moses did not uh, go about it the right way. So Moses sinned, and there are severe consequences for that sin. What did God say? You will not bring the congregation into the land. There probably couldn't have been uh, any keener punishment. He was looking forward to making the final delivery of the package, if you know what I mean. So this was a great disappointment. In Deuteronomy 1, verse 36, Moses now is rehearsing the experience of the children of Israel. And he said, no one's going to enter the promised land from that original group that are over 20 years of age, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. He shall see it. To him and all his children, I'm giving the land on which he walked, because he wholly followed the Lord. The Lord was also angry with me for your sakes, saying, even you shall not enter in here. Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he will go in there. Encourage him, for he will cause the children of Israel to inherit it. There's several things I want you to notice here. First of all, it might have been a little bit hard when you know somebody is replacing you because you perform poorly. And then the boss says, uh, I want you to train them and tell them everything you know because they're going to take your place when you're fired. How do you like that assignment? We've hired your replacement, encourage them, teach them, train them, because you're not going into the promised land. You don't, get, you don't get your retirement. But he took that well. The other thing is, um, don't miss the words. You do you have your Bibles open? I want you to highlight a verse if you do. If you look here, I read through it, but I don't know if you caught it. Deuteronomy 3, verse 26. But the Lord was angry with me on your account and would not listen to me. Who does that remind you of? Who took the anger of the Lord on our account? Jesus. Moses is the great mediator. He is one of the most powerful types of Christ in the Bible. Did the devil try to kill Jesus as a baby? Did the devil try to kill Moses as a baby? He did. Did uh, was Moses born among slaves, but he was never a slave? Jesus was born among sinners, but he was never a sinner. Was Moses the great mediator that went between God and man? A mediator, of course, is, you know, a go-between. Moses said, I'll speak to the Lord, and then I'll come and I'll speak to you, and then I'll go back and speak to the Lord. Went up the mountain, and Christ is our intercessor. You see a picture of Joshua leading the children of Israel into battle with the Amalekites, and Moses is standing on the mountain with his arms outstretched. And as long as the people see him with his arms stretched out, interceding for them, they're victorious. When his arms get tired, they go down, they lose. So Aaron and her lift his arms back up, they win. Lose, win. Lose, 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 lose win. <laughs> but they notice there was a connection. What does that say to us? When we see Jesus on that hill, on the cross, with his arms stretched out, and we know that he's interceding now with his hands stretched out before the Father, that it is encouraging us in the battle against the enemy. Amen? So he says, the Lord was angry with me on your account. You know, even though there's great people in the Bible, uh, sometimes they don't always get uh, everything they may have wanted. What was the big desire of David's heart? He wanted to build a temple for the Lord. And uh, here he had been a shepherd living in tents, and, and uh, he saw the tabernacle of the Lord was in a tent, but finally David became king, and he had a beautiful house, but the tabernacle was still in a tent, or the ark was still in a tent. 
And uh, he wanted to build it. And first Nathan said, go for it. The Lord is with you, David. Then God spoke to Nathan the prophet and said, go back, tell David, no, you're a bloody man. You cannot build it for me. But your son, his name is Solomon or peace. He will build me a house. Your son will build me a house that will last forever. Da Jesus is the son of David who built the house for the Lord. David didn't get to fulfill his promise of doing it himself. So he made every provision for his son. Moses did not get to bring the people into the promised land. So he made every provision for Joshua. And the book of Deuteronomy was sort of the final message of encouragement, rehearsing the history. I think I told you it, it's um, one of the most important books because it's the book Jesus quotes from three times when he's tempted by the devil. All three times he quotes from Deuteronomy. When the nation of Israel had lost the word of God and Hilkiah the priest was cleaning out the temple, he says, we found the book of the law. They had found the book of Deuteronomy. And that brought about a revival. So it's the, the message here is very powerful. Moses writes that book after he knows he's not going to make it into the promised land physically. So then we got the next section, the sin of Moses, part two. Deuteronomy 31, verse one and two. Then Moses went and spoke these words to all of Israel. He said to them, I am 120 years old today. I can no longer go out and come in. Also the Lord has said to me, you shall not cross over this Jordan. Moses was realizing his limitations. And he said, uh, now when it says he's 120 years old, he said, I can't go out and come in. I don't think it means that Moses was feeble because you read later, but before he died, he climbs a mountain and the Bible says his natural force was not abated and his eyes had not dimmed. I, I think he's telling him, you know, I can't go into the promised land. I can't continue to go out and come in and lead you anymore as he had done. He had been going in and coming out to the tabernacle as their representative and the time was gonna end. Deuteronomy 34 verse one. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is across from Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead as far as Dan and all Naphtali. Now, why does God show him this? You know, God said, look, I know how much you wanted to lead them into the land, but I'm going to give you a vision of the land. Now, we've been in that country before. And from the top of Mount Pisgah or Nebo, um, and you'll, when you sing in your hymnal, you'll be surprised. There's several songs that talk about from Pisgah's lofty heights or something like that. It's referring to the mountain where Moses saw the promised land from this mountain. But um, you can't see all the places that are mentioned here with natural eyes. If you've got eagle vision, you can't see all these places because they were hidden by other mountains. So when it says God showed him this, he saw it in a supernatural vision here. He says, let me go back here to Deuteronomy chapter 4, and you can read here. And it says, it showed him the land across the land of Gilead as far as Dan, that's way up in the north, all of Naphtali, and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah as far as the western sea. Now, for one thing, had the children of Israel had their land divided to them yet? No, the land had not even been divided. So how, how is it God showing them the land of Judah and he's showing them the land of Manasseh? They hadn't even cast lots to figure out whose land was whose land. God is showing Moses in vision the land. You know, it's kind of fun. How many of you have a drone? I got one, two, three, four, five, six. I don't have a drone. Amazing Facts has a drone. They're really neat because you can get an aerial perspective and they're using drones for all kinds of things. And, you know, they're, the people get lost in the woods. They're sending up a drone to go find them now. And if folks are hiking down a trail and they don't know which way to turn, they send the drone up and they go look around. And the movies are almost exclusively using drones where they used to use helicopters to get these great shots. It's really great because it gives you an interesting perspective. On the uh, website of our church, you'll see that uh, opening shot is a video. It's a flyover of the church with a drone. Well, God actually gave him sort of like a drone shot of the promised land, but he didn't show it to them the way it was. I think he showed them the promised land at its zenith of glory, the land flowing with milk and honey. Now, whenever you say that, if you've ever been to Israel, 
And you, you know, I remember reading in the Bible about this land flowing with milk and honey. And then you read the stories in the Bible, you know, Absalom's riding through the woods and he gets his head caught in a tree. And, and Jonathan's going through the woods and honey is dripping from the trees. And you, you hear about the woods. And uh, then you go to Israel and it's a lot of desert. And you don't see a lot of honey and you don't see a lot of milk and you don't see a lot of woods. And you're going, what happened? Well, this has been one of the most conquered lands in history. I'll tell you a little secret that one of our tour guides told us is there was one ruler, I don't know if it was Solomon the Magnificent, but one of the Muslim rulers that he decided to tax people based on how many trees they had on their land. Well, what would you do if you're being taxed on the number of trees you have on your land? They cut them down. Do you know why the homes are so narrow in Holland? because they taxed people based on how much street frontage they had. So you know what the people did? They built their houses where they were eight feet wide and seven stories tall. It's interesting what people do to avoid taxes. So they cut down all the trees in the Promised Land and then they were conquered by a couple of nations who came through and they sowed salt in the land. And it destroyed the, the farming ability. And so the land you see now is not like the land there was then. Indeed, you read about Job. Job talks about his flocks and his herds and his camels and his sheep and his donkeys and all the livestock he had. Job lived in an area that is desert now. So the climate has changed in the last 2,000, 3,000 years from the time of Moses, yeah, 3,500 years ago. Uh, things were different back then. And um, he, God showed him this land that was beautiful, uh, farming land, springs of water, lots of vegetation, forests, a beautiful land. There was fruit. They had grapes that were so big it took two men to carry one cluster of grapes back then. That's before the Jews even started farming it. So it must have been a beautiful land. So God shows them this because he loves them. It says, I've caused you to see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over there. So God gives him this, uh, this beautiful vision of the land. But God tells him then he's got to cr climb a mountain. And uh, you can read here in Numbers chapter 21, verse, uh, Numbers 20, verse 1. The children of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Who's Miriam? Moses' older sister who had saved him. Numbers 20, verse 23. And the Lord spoke to Aaron, Moses and Aaron in Mount Hor by the borders of the land of Edom, saying, Aaron shall be gathered to his people. He shall not enter the land that I've given the children of Israel because you rebelled against my word at the waters of Meribah. So not only Moses, but Aaron was there with him. He could not enter. And then with everyone watching, Aaron now takes off his regal robes and he gives them to his son, Aaron is basically stripped, and uh, he has to now pass the baton onto his son, just as Moses later does with Joshua. And it says, now Aaron died, and the house of uh, Israel mourned for him for 30 days. Now you go to the death of Moses. We can't have the resurrection of Moses till we have the death of Moses. Deuteronomy 34, verse 5. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there on top of Mount Nebo. Now that... He climbs this mountain alone. That must have been a lonely situation. You know, in the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 440, uh, the author there comments on this. Moses knew that he was to die alone. No earthly friend would be permitted to minister to him in his last hours. There was a mystery and an awfulness about the scene before him from which his heart shrank. The severest trial was his separation from the people of his care and his love the people with whom his interests in his life had so long been united. But he had learned to trust God, and with unquestioning faith, he committed himself to him and his people to, their, to his love and mercy. Jesus was separated from the Father for our sin, and Moses was separated from the people for their sin. And uh, he died alone. But, you know, it's, it's beautiful when you think about it. There's a... Uh, couple of services pastors perform. You've got the baptisms, got marriages, you got funerals. Having baptism today. 
Um, who performed the first marriage? God did for Adam and Eve. It says he presented Eve to Adam. Who did Moses' funeral? It says the Lord buried him. Wouldn't that be something? As the angels look on this faithful servant after all those years, we read that God is the one who performed the service. It says, according to the word of the Lord, he died there, and he, verse 6 of Deuteronomy 34, he buried him. You know, you see a picture of God taking the earth and making Adam. Here you've got God taking the earth and covering it over Moses. He buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows of his grave to this day. Why? God did not want them to make it a shrine that they would worship at. That's the last thing that Moses would have wanted as well. So he hid it. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor his natural vigor diminished. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plain 30 days, like they did for Aaron. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses ended. By the way, do uh, you realize there's a 100% death rate? If Jesus doesn't come and you're not translated, you'll die. But there are good ways to die and there are bad ways to die. You ought to do everything you can to die like Moses, where you don't die over the last 20 years of your life because of bad living habits. You know what I'm saying? And uh, you're debilitated, you're not functioning. You want to be able to be busy to the last day we, in the little church that I used to pastor up in the hills of Covalo, this church was really founded by a bunch of retired people, but they were all very, very dedicated, and they lived a long time. We had one member, 111. And um, it was interesting that they kind of like fell over in their gardens, 95 years old. Yeah, we found Monty. Where was he? In his garden. You know, they were busy to the end. I thought, that's how you want to go. Amen. You just you take care of yourself, and, uh, and then the Lord buried him. Now we've got the resurrection of Moses. Jude verse 9. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, he dared not bring against him a railing or reviling accusation, but he said, The Lord rebuke thee. Now who else rebuked the devil when they were tempted? Jesus did. Michael the archangel... Who is Michael the archangel? We've got to talk about that before we talk about the resurrection of Moses. Now, I always address this with some trepidation because when you tell people what the Bible says on this, it can kind of shock them. And a lot of people, especially in the Catholic world or the Orthodox churches, they talk about these angels and they got Michael and they got Raphael and there may be some others and they've named these angels and they worship them. They got statues of them and they think they're angels. Well, Nowhere in the Bible is it telling us that there are multiple archangels. The word archangel means the highest or the chief. It's like you've got um, yeah, the word archelaus in uh, Greek. It means the highest. An arch, a Roman arch, you get the keystone at the top. It was the highest. And this is a description of Christ. The word angel means messenger. Now alert, now hear this. I am not saying that Jesus is an angel. Jesus is not a cherub. Jesus is not a seraphim. The Bible is telling us that one of the titles for Christ, when he would appear in the Old Testament in the form of an angel, Christ, it's called, it's called a Christophany. All theologians agree with that, that when the Lord spoke to Abraham. And here's one example. When Joshua is uh, fighting against the people of Ai, it says he saw this man of war. And Joshua said, are you for us or for our enemies? He said, neither, but I've come as a commander of the Lord's host. He said, take your shoes off your feet, for where you stand is holy ground. Same thing he said to Moses. That was the same Lord who appeared to Moses in the burning bush when he took his shoes off the feet. Joshua falls down to worship him and addresses him as Lord, but he appears as the angel of the Lord's army. That's Michael the archangel. That's Christ. The, even Moses said, the angel that will lead you through the wilderness. And he said, the Lord will raise up a servant like me. Him you will hear. That's Christ. Now let's look at some of the evidence that helps us understand this. Uh, first of all, the Bible tells us pretty clearly in Hebrews 
that uh, Jesus is much higher than the angels. Jesus is the eternal son of God. Are you all listening very carefully, especially folks who are watching? We're not saying Jesus is an angel. We're saying that one of the titles for Christ in the Old Testament was Michael the Archangel. The very name, Michael, means who is as God. The greatest messenger who is as God. That's Jesus. You read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel. Who has the voice of the archangel? The Lord himself shall descend from heaven. The voice of the archangel. Daniel chapter 12, at that time Michael will stand up. The great prince that stands for the children of thy people means he stands in our behalf, stands as our intercessor. Who is the great prince that stands as our intercessor? It's Jesus, right? And it's when Christ stands up and he ceases his intercession as when a judge stands up, this great time of trouble begins. Then you also read that it says that uh, Michael comes to resurrect the body of Moses. Now there's no record in the Bible of this event. There is a Jewish tradition that's probably based on truth that three days after Moses died, the Lord raised him up. It's in a, a, a book called The Assumption of Moses. Sometimes it's called The Testament of Moses. This is an extra biblical book that's probably written during the Babylonian captivity. They don't know, but it was based on some traditions and it says after three days God raised him. That part's probably true. And um, how do we know that Moses was raised? You read about him appearing, and we'll get to that in a moment, in uh, the Mount of Transfiguration experience you find in Mark chapter 9. So, Revelation chapter uh, 12, verse 7, it says, Michael fought and his angels, and the dragon and his angels fought. Now, who is the dragon? Is the devil really a dragon, or is the word dragon a symbolic name for the devil? Dragon is a symbolic name. Then why would we be surprised if Michael is a symbolic name for Christ? So when you're reading about Michael in the Bible, this is usually a pre-incarnation title for Jesus, uh, the great messenger to our world. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is divine. He's eternal. We believe that. But in the Old Testament, he's sometimes referred to as Michael the Archangel. And by the way, this is not theology of our church. Charles Spurgeon, Matthew Henry, many of the great commentators, they say the same thing because they have done the detective work. They put the pieces together. So when Jesus comes for the body of Moses after three days, another way in which Christ is similar to Moses or Moses to Christ, the devil says, you can't have him. So he sinned. And... Michael doesn't engage him. He says, you know, he's repented of his sin. Lord rebuke thee. And he raises him up. You know, the devil is the accuser of the brethren. The devil's the one who stood there and accused Joshua, the high priest, and said, uh, look at his filthy garments. And guard, the Lord rebukes him and gives Joshua clean garments. The devil is not wanting you to go to heaven. But the Lord rebukes the devil. And by God's grace and through faith, Moses had repented of his sin. Amen? So the Lord could save him. And then Moses is raised up. Now I want to read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and this is under the resurrection of us all. What happened to Moses is something we're all looking forward to. Can you say amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, Paul had a lot of problems with the Corinthian church. Among them, they had struggled to believe in the resurrection, or they thought it was already past, or that there was no resurrection. Paul says, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Go to verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death. Now, why does it say Christ is the first fruits if Moses had already been resurrected? First fruits does not always mean first in sequence. First fruits also means in priority. The president's wife is called the first lady. It doesn't mean she was the first lady that made it to North America. It means that she's given a position of honor or high, high esteem. So Christ, the first fruits of those who slept, for since by man, Adam, death came, by man also, Christ, came the resurrection of the dead. 
For in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. But each one in his own order. Some people think you die and go right to heaven. Moses had a special resurrection, but how's it, how does it happen for most people? Those that are Christ's afterward at his coming. When are they raised? After, afterwards. In it, where are the dead now? Sleeping. Do they know they're sleeping? No. If they're saved and they're dead, for them the next conscious thought is the presence of the Lord. To be absent from the body, be present with the Lord. But they don't feel that now because it hasn't happened. We live in time. And then finally, in, uh, you've got it in Mark chapter 9 also. I'm going to read you from Luke chapter 9. Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings, he took Peter, James, and John and went up on the mountain to pray. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered. His robe became white and glistening, and behold, two men talked with him, and they were Moses and Elijah. Jesus no doubt addressed them by their names. Who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish. Here now comes Moses to encourage Jesus, who's going to go to the cross. Isn't that something? And when Moses had to die and go through his isolation, Jesus was there to encourage him. Now Moses is coming to encourage Jesus in his sacrifice. Because what's going to happen to Moses and Elijah in heaven if Jesus is not sacrificed? Do they get to stay? You can see why uh, they would be very motivated to encourage Jesus. And it says that um, he was about to accomplish his sacrifice in Jerusalem, but Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And it appeared as they were parting from him that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. Moses is in heaven now. Matter of fact, uh, he could be listening to this lesson right now. Isn't Moses in heaven? Yes. That's, he's where you and I want to be. And, of course, Moses is uh, a symbol for the, the Word of God, the Old Testament, Elijah, is talking about he's a great prophet, so you get the law and the prophets in those two who appeared to Jesus to encourage him. We are out of time, but I hope you learned something. I've really enjoyed this book of Deuteronomy. If you missed it at the beginning, we have a special book for you, a special free color magazine called The Day of the Lord. We will send you a free copy if you simply ask. You can call 866-788-3966. That's 866-STUDY-MORE. And if you want, we can also text this to you. And, or you can get it through texting. In the U.S., text SH108 to 40544. And uh, we'd like you to be blessed by this magazine. Read it and share it with someone else. God bless you, friends. We'll look forward to studying with you again next week. Welcome.